So let's begin talking a little bit about Gehenom, first Gehenom. I want you to remember that in Judaism, there's nothing really that is described as plain punishment. What did I say in the very beginning of the lecture? That everything is good and everything is for the good? Even when we are punished, it's not a real punishment. It's not a real revenge from Hashem. I'm very upset at you. I'm angry at you. You're going to get this for doing that. No. Hashem is good. Hashem therefore does not do bad. So Gehenom is a form of Tikkun. It's to cleanse the Neshama. It's to atone. When we are alive, when there was a Bet HaMikdash, there were various forms of atonement. There were korbanot, there were sacrifices, together with confession, which, I mean, the sacrifice was, was a form of penalty. It costs money. It was symbolic in nature. It, it meant that you have to come all the way to Yushalayim and beg forgiveness and go through the whole ritual with the Kohen. It wasn't easy to bring a sacrifice. Today, we don't have sacrifices, but we have our prayer books, we have Teshuvah, we have Taniyot, we have fast days. There are other ways of doing Teshuvah, of being remorseful and asking Hashem for forgiveness. And what does that do? It allows us to make a U-turn and start all over again. You get on the wrong freeway, in Southern California, you're very lucky. Why? Because Baruch Hashem, there's a lot of off-ramps. You just get out and you get back on the right freeway. You were supposed to go four or five north and you're headed four or five south. As long as you realize it on time. Otherwise, you'll, you'll come to Mexico before you know it. Right? But if you're trying to go out north, then, you know, if you don't have a map and you don't read the signs, you're going to make a mistake. But Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, sends the highway patrol. And sometimes he stops us for speeding and we're very upset. I wasn't speeding. Yes, you were speeding. I have a radar to prove it. Why argue? It's home in Hashemayim. Go to traffic school and pay your ticket. It's a lesson. What's the lesson? Once you get into a conversation with the highway patrolman, he'll tell you, oh, by the way, where are you going this morning? Well, I'm going to San Francisco. No, you're not. You're going to Tijuana. You're going south. Really? Yeah. You don't read the signs. Oh, thank God you stopped me. <laughs> you see? It was a benefit that he was stopped because otherwise he would have made a mistake. How much time would have been spent? How much time lost? Turn around. Baruch Hashem, there's an off ramp. You just get off and get on the north instead of the south. Try that in New York. You have to wait for 25 miles before you're able to get off <laughs> and turn around. What is that? Not as many. This is a planned city. New York is not. So therefore, you're, if you're some places, if you're stuck, it takes you a long time before you can get off to make the turn. But what are you going to do? You just have to go and go and go for 25 miles and then get out. And that's, uh, you're stuck for a long time. Here, Baruch Hashem, everything is planned. But who needs to go back down? Just read the signs. So Gehenom is a tikkun. A tikkun, a kapara. For what we've done wrong. And there are various levels of Gehenom. There's various durations of Gehenom. I don't want to describe to you all the departments of Gehenom. Because you won't be able to sleep tonight. Yeah. But it's, it's very hot there. <laughs> Not only is it a very hot there, it's not a very comfortable place. Let's just put it that way. There's, by the way, there's even a Gehenom of snow. A cold Gehenom. These are all spiritual descriptions of a spiritual world. Why? Because we're talking about the Neshama that has to go undergo the purification, the atonement. So these are things that we have a hard time describing. But if you read Sepharim about what goes on there, it's painful. But that pain is good for the neshama because it cleanses. Why does the neshama need to be cleansed? If the neshama is not cleansed, it is very embarrassed of itself. It knows the truth upstairs. By knowing the truth, it, it, it's embarrassing. And that busha, that embarrassment, is in itself a gainom, the rabbis tell us. But the, hard, the worst part about it is that neshama wants to not just go to its final resting place. It wants to enjoy the tremendous aura of the Shekhinah, of the presence of the Shekhinah that exists there. And it feels that it cannot get too close if it's soiled, if the Neshama is stained. It's just like, exactly, Rabbi says, it's like a bride about to enter. You know, after they took all the pictures of the two sides, the bride is about to enter the dancing hall, right? And all of a sudden, somebody spilled some ketchup on her beautiful white dress. What do you think she's going to do? 
Is she going to go in with all the ketchup over her? I don't think so. <laughs> She's going to either try to change clothes or try to wash it off. If it comes off, do her best. She's embarrassed to go in like that. The neshama is embarrassed to get close to the Shekhinah, embarrassed to, to see itself the way it is. It knows the truth already. Upstairs, they know the truth. There's no lying. There's no being misled. They know everything with clarity. And they have tremendous embarrassment. And that embarrassment is the greatest Gehenom of all. When one sees, what a shame. What a waste. They gave me 79 years to prepare myself, and I just wasted it. I went to play golf. I played cards. I watched TV. I watched the Internet. I read the LA Times, the Washington Times, the New York Times. All this stuyot, all this nonsense. And didn't, didn't do anything positive and constructive with my time. So that embarrassment is also a form of Gehenom. Rabbis tell us that the duration of Gehenom for Rashaim, for those who are wicked, for those who completely went against the Torah, is 12 months. Everybody else doesn't stay that long. One month, two months, three months, if at all. The reason why not everybody goes to Gehenom, however, even though they were not good people, is either because they were very, very poor, and the poverty itself, a life of suffering and poverty, is mechaper, helps in the atonement, or because they, had, they were chole me'ayim. Chole me'ayim means they had tremendous stomach problems, cancer, illnesses, where they suffered a great number of years. That also means that they don't go to Gehenom. And there's a third individual, one who has had a isha ra'a for a wife, one who married a very wicked woman, who gave him a difficult time. He doesn't go to Gehenom because he already had it here in this world. So any singles who want to marry such a woman, raise your hand. <laughs> I don't know about such a woman, but, uh, but if you have a hard time, just know, at least you'll have Gan Eden. The rabbis tell us, what should a person do who has a bad wife? The rabbi says, divorce. That's what divorce is for, when things are really bad. So why, do, why doesn't everybody divorce? Either because they have small children, or because in the ketuvah, in the marriage contract, they promised her a million dollars, you know, in the, in the event of the divorce, or because they know the Gemara, that whoever has such a woman, you know, she, they will go straight to Gan Eden. So they say, you know what, I'll, I'll bear with it a little bit longer. So anyway, Gehenom in itself, therefore, is not the end of the world, as long as you come out. There's three things that are worse than Gehenom. One is Karet i Karet. There's different kinds of karet. Karet means to cut off. Sometimes a person is cut off in this world. He lives less years. But sometimes there's karet of the neshama that the Kabbalah discusses. Not everybody gets that, but Hashem, very, very few people. That the neshama is completely erased, completely gone, disappears. Nothing is left of it. And there's something called genom of the worst kind, which is beyond 12 months, and that's called lediraon olam where they stay there, wherever they are, in the lowest level of Genom forever. But these are exceptions. Genom usually is not more than 12 months. But there is one place, however, that one can be there for 100 or 200 or 300 years. And that's called Kafa Kela. Kafa Kela, loosely translated in English, is the slingshot. The slingshot means because the Neshama has no rest. It's being pursued by demons, all kinds of demons. Because they don't even let it enter Gehenom. It's so bad, it did such terrible things, it was so wicked, that they don't let it go into Gehenom to get its cleansing. And it's begging to go into Gehenom. No, not yet. You have to spend a hundred years in Kafa Kela. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Some of the Shamod have been in Kafa Kela for several hundreds of years. There's one that I'm not going to mention the name of, that uh, we know through a story that happened that his neshama was in the Kafa Kela for about 300 years. Yeah, until he, a big Mekubal was able to make a tikkun for him. And the, way, the way we know this is through an incident that happened that Bezat Hashem I'll talk about maybe when we talk about Dibukim. Dibukim are souls that have possessed others who are still alive. But we know that certain neshamot spend a lot of time in Kafa Kela. They don't have any rest. They're wandering from place to place, being pursued by demonic beings until they're finally allowed to go into Gehenom to get their final cleansing. Once they get their final cleansing, 
they either go to their final resting place, which, ha which occurs in Gan Eden, or they still can come back in a Gilgul, in a reincarnation, to get whatever they need to enter Gan Eden. Yes? Do uh, go through the same process? Similar, not the same. Goim go through a similar but not the same process, no. Because they have a different, they also go through judgment upstairs. That's the first thing that happens after the Shiva, actually, that there's, this, there's judgment. The person has to give an accounting for all that he did. So everybody, every human being goes through that. But they have a slightly different process because what, what is expected of them is different than what is expected of us. They don't have that much the tikkun of Gilgul and Rikanation as the Jews do. Nevertheless, sometimes they come down too to allow for certain things to be uh, straightened out that, uh, that, are, that were not. But the process is, is uh, not, the, not exactly the same. Is it less of the expectation? Or? No, they have, different, they have different commandments. They only have seven, right? Um, they don't have as many obligations as the Jews do. What is that? I'll tell you later what they are, yeah. So, as far as going to Gehenom, we said before, it is possible that somebody will not enter Gehenom right away, either because of some zechut, he studied Torah, and the Torah protects him from Gehenom, or because he experienced a difficult life. Nevertheless, it doesn't mean that he gets to go free. If he does not have enough merits to enter Gan Eden, which is the final resting place for the Neshama, then he has to come back in a Gilgul. Now, what's the advantage of a Gilgul? The disadvantage is obvious. You have to come back again, go through diapers, go through preschool, right? Eventually high school, uh, the army, if you're in Israel maybe, get married, again, children. Life, it's not easy. That's the disadvantage if you look at it that way. What's the advantage of Gilgul? The advantage of Gilgul is that every time you come back, you have an additional opportunity to earn more credit, more merits than if you would have been just, if you would have stayed upstairs. So therefore, there is an opportunity to gain more. What about the opportunity to lose more? That doesn't happen. The Kabbalah explains that only the portion of the neshama that is, needs repair comes down. That all the good that you have done stays upstairs, so you cannot ruin all the good that you have done. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. You always keep coming back. You're always losing never-ending gain. So only the part that needs to repair comes down because the neshama can split itself into sparks. Only the part that needs repair comes down. The part that is good stays upstairs. And of course, once it's down here below, it can attain great heights, new opportunities to perform its votum asim to him good deeds. And therefore, he, his share or his reward upstairs will now become increased. It will be greater than had he not come uh, down for a gigul. Okay, so that's more or less the portion that deals with Genom. Now let's talk a little bit about Gan Eden. 